Uh, we're studying a new topic today devoted to the general pathology of infectious diseases and the fundamental enigma in the field of infectious diseases is the clinical variability between individuals in the course of infection. Various theories attribute this clinical variability to different sources, microbial variability in the microbiological theory, environmental variability, uh, not including that uh, of the pathogen considered, but potentially including that of the microbes, is considered in the ecological theory, somatic community variability, both adaptive and acquired, in the immunological or somatic theory, and germline immunity variability, um, in the genetic theory, and immunity variability implies intrinsic, innate, and adaptive immunity. We will discuss here the genetic theory of infectious diseases, focusing in particular on its development and achievement in the context of the well-established microbiological and immunological theories. By concentrating on these three theories, we do not mean to underplay the importance of the ecological theory as uh, neatly illustrated by the impact of dual infection. Uh, however, we will mostly focus on microbiological and immunological. On the picture, you see all the four complementary theories of infectious diseases. In principle, inter-individual inter variability of cl the clinical presentation, ranging from asymptomatic to lethal infection, in infected individuals can depend on four sets of overlapping forces corresponding to the microbiological, ecological, immunological, and genetic theories. Disease is attributed to microbial variation in the microbiological theory, to environmental variation <coughs> in the ecological theory, to a deficiency of acquired somatic adaptive immunity, in the immunological theory and to inborn errors of germline encoded immunity in the genetic theory. These four theories are both complementary and overlapping. The misunderstanding be between microbiologists, immunolo immunologists and geneticists stem from the historical schools of thought regarding the dreadful problem of childhood fever and death. It is therefore useful to briefly review the history of the field of infectious diseases, including in particular the paradoxical and mind-boggling discovery that the same infectious agent can cause lethal fever in one child and asymptomatic infection in another. Attempts to resolve the conundrum have led to seemingly conflicting but actually overlapping and perfectly complementary solutions based on host immunological and genetic theories. This brief introduction to the history of infectious diseases provides a rational basis for collaborative, comprehensive, fruitful approaches to the continual threat to humanity and living organisms, animals and plants alike, posed by existing, emerging and re-emerging microbes. On the picture, you see a historical perspective of the pathogenesis of infection diseases. The development of physiology and pathology in the early 19th century, which opposed vitalism and were based on physics and chemistry, understandably led to the view that diseases were intrinsic. Compelling experimental evidence established the role of microbes, and uh, this work was uh, helped uh, by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. That led to the germ theory of infection diseases in the most extraordinary paradigm shift ever seen in medicine. The subsequent discovery at the turn of the 20th century that asymptomatic infection is much more common than disease for almost all microbes only marginally modified the almost universal and deeply rooted, although only recently acquired, perception that infectious diseases are fundamentally intrinsic, extrinsic. I'm sorry. Moreover, inter-individual variability in the course of infection was rapidly and easily explained by the emerging immunological theory, resulting in a somatic acquired immunological theory of infection diseases, best illustrated by the impact of vaccinations. 
The complementary idea that human germline um, genetic variation could account for disease development, particularly for childhood infections, lethal in the course of primary infection, was proposed early on by distinguished pioneers such as Archibald Gerald with the concept of inborn errors of immunity, the first demonstration of which was provided in the early 1950s by the descriptions of the first primary immunodeficiency and of the protective role of the sickle cell trait against severe malaria. <clears throat> we will highlight eight inborn errors of immunity underlying infectious diseases that in our view neatly illustrate the explanatory power of a human genetic theory of childhood infectious diseases. Four population based shown by the blue text on the slide, including protection against severe malaria, Mendelian resistance to common plasmodium vivax infection and to human immunodeficiency virus 1 infection, and control of hepatitis C virus clearance continuously or with treatment by common variants. The other four are patient-based, shown by the green text, primary immunodeficiencies and multiple infections, the first described primary and selective Mendelian susceptibilities to Epstein-Barr virus, mycobacteria and herpes simplex virus 1 infections. The discovery of inborn errors of immunity has greatly accelerated over the past decade owing particularly to the tremendous progress in genetic technologies. <clears throat> Since the dawn of humanity, the most formidable problem ravaging its numbers has been childhood fever, which frequently led to death. Life expectancy at birth did not exceed 20 to 25 years worldwide for at least the past 10,000 years. Mortality by the age of 15 was approximately 50% in the past 10,000 years, and fever was by far the main cause of childhood death killing many more than war and famine. There were, of course, many types of fever, but the physicians could hardly come up with accurate descriptions and a proper nosology until the rise of the clinical pathological paradigm in Parisian hospitals at about the time of the French Revolution. These initial descriptions did not touch on the questions of whether fever and disease were intrinsic or extrinsic. Paradoxically, the concomitant physiological revolution initiated by Antoine Lavoisier, François Magendi, and Claude Bernard, shown on the picture, favored the view that diseases, including fevers, were intrinsic. These three giants in the field suggested and demonstrated against forceful opposition that living organisms obey the law of physics and chemistry. Disease is not a distinct entity, but rather an alteration of physiology, and human and animal life revolves around a milieu interior, um, internal environment that provides protection against environmental variation. By defeating vitalism, focusing on the mechanisms underlying health and disease, separating high organisms from the environment and raising the scientific sense standards of biology and medicine after a 50-year battle against the talented clinical pathologists who have themselves established modern pathology and clinical medicine against long-standing traditions, these three founders of modern experimental medicine made it more difficult for the germ theory to emerge. Men of genius, albeit with a more narrow focus, such as John Snow, Ignaz Samelweis, and Jean Antoine uh, Willemin, understandably failed to convince the world that fevers were contagious, despite their superb discoveries and heroic attitudes in the face of public hostility. Indeed, they failed to identify the microorganisms first, seen by Antoine van Leeuwenhoek in the late 17th century as agents of contagion. The successful fight of the great physiologists against the proponents of vital forces and vital disease entities was not without collateral damage. Diseases could hardly be seen as extrinsic, at least not until beyond reasonable effort. <laughs>
Pasteur, who firmly established causal relationship between microbes, contagion, infection and disease, provided a definitive solution to the problem of childhood fever. After the loss of the third of his five children to fever, Pasteur was asked in 1865 to travel to Al to investigate the reasons for the decimation of silkworm populations. While pursuing his PhD, Pasteur had earlier discovered the principle of chemical chirality and he had later shown that microbial growth was responsible for fermentation and that living matter was not generated spontaneously. He established the germ theory of diseases in 1867-1868 with the discovery that two diseases of silkworms, pibrin and flacherie, were contagious and infectious. This and subsequent discoveries of animal and human pathogens met with violent opposition, particularly from veterinary surgeons and physicians. Most of Pasteur's opponents probably held out until Robert Koch's discovery of myco mycobacterium tuberculosis in 1882, when the evidence finally became refutable. This then threw the spotlight on inter-individual variability. Why did only some children die of fever? Infection was widely believed to be synonymous with disease, which was itself often synonymous with death. Pasteur's aphorism, one disease, one microbe, one vaccine, reminds us of this causal relationship, which was perhaps expressed even more rigorously by Koch in his 1882 postulates, including the notion that the pathogen should be found in patients and not in healthy individuals. For European microbiologists at the time, microbes literally caused infectious diseases. They were the pathogens, they were thought to be both necessary and sufficient for the development of disease. However, with hindsight, it is interesting to note that Pasteur seems to have neglected his own previous observation that flashery is also hereditary, in the sense that predisposition rather than the infectious agent itself is transmitted from parents to offspring. His chapter on flashery, published in 1870, is actually entitled Hereditary Flashery. As Du Bois noted, Pasteur might then have decided to take a different route. There were also other observations that did not entirely fit into the newly established paradigm based on this radical view of the germ theory of diseases. For example, the observation that not all sick children died from infection suggested that other factors possibly relating to the nature of the host were at play. Similarly, Max von Pettenkofer, a strong opponent of the contagion theory, survived after drinking a solution of Vibrio Calero provided by Koch himself. Nevertheless, the germ theory of diseases was victorious in the face of much skepticism, thereby establishing what remains the greatest paradigm shift in medicine. The first explanation of inter-individual clinical variability in the course of infection followed naturally from another groundbreaking discovery by Pasteur between 1880 and 1882, the prevention of infectious diseases and the foundation of immunology with the use of attenuated microbes to vaccinate against fall cholera in sheep anthrax. Pasteur generalized the term vaccination as a tribute to Benjamin Jesty and Edward Jenner. The ship anthrax experiment carried out at Paul Lillefort in 1881 can be seen as the birth of immunology, which would then relentlessly investigate the cellular and molecular basis of the diversity, specificity and memory of immune responses. The subsequent success of vaccination against human rabies was a triumph that was acc acclaimed worldwide. These observations probably gradually and implicitly led to the notion that related less virulent microbes or, or smaller amounts of the same, mi same microbes had previously immunized sick individuals who survived infection with a microbe virulent enough to kill other individuals.
This powerful idea forms the basis of the immunological theory of infection diseases. We know now that um, this acquired immunity requires the cells and molecules of adaptive immunity, a lymphoid system with B cell and T cell arms. The system has both genetic and epigenetic components and was so crucial to vertebrates that by convergent evolution it emerged twice in the development of this group of animals. The limited inter-individual variability in the course of infection documented by this time could therefore be explained by a powerful emergent theory. After Pasteur's initial hypothesis to account for immunity, two competing breakthroughs occurred. Ilya Mechnikov's discovery of macrophage-mediated phagocytosis, and Mechnikov is shown on the picture on the left, and Paul Elric's discovery of antigen-specific antibody response, shown on the right. Unsurprisingly, the antibody response became the dominant paradigm because it paved the way for the study of specificity, diversity and memory. The phagocyte theory was of less intellectual relevance in the immunology stemming from the first vaccination experiments. Moreover, two great practical breakthroughs, including Ferdinand Vidal's discovery of serology-based diagnosis and Charles Richesse and Emile von Behring's discovery of serotherapy, preceded and accompanied the antibody theory. The extraordinary therapeutic success of both vaccination and serotherapy naturally provided support for the immunological theory of infectious diseases. However, Vidal's work on serodiagnosis, Richer's work on anaphylaxis and Clements von Perker's work on allergies soon suggested that a much larger proportion of individual, individuals that initially thought apparently remained asymptomatic despite infection with numer numerous microbes. Moreover, further surprises were in store with the realization that inter-individual variability was even greater than anyone had previously imagined. The immunological theory could account for inter-individual variability in the course of reactivation or secondary infections, but it had less power to explain the high degree of inter-individual inter -individual variability in the course of primary infection. By the turn of the 20th century, it had become increasingly clear that most individuals infected by the greatest killer of humankind, such as mycobacterium tuberculosis, pneumococcus and other microbes, remained completely healthy. The results of serology and hypersensitivity studies provided the first hint of this problem. But this issue was brought into sharp focus by the discovery of silent, latent infections in which dormant, non-replicating living microbes are found in the tissues of healthy individuals. Von Perkez's discovery that a large proportion of individuals displayed a subcutaneous reaction to tuberculin was followed by Charles Mantou's observation of delayed type hypersensitivity to intradermal tuberculin in countless infected but healthy individuals. This problem could, however, be addressed by the immunological theory, as microbial latency and specific immunity may be seen as twin principle. One could surmise that the individuals who had survived previous infection or had stronger immunity or both were better able to keep microbes in a dormant state. A much more difficult problem was posed by Charles Nicole's discovery of inapparent infections between 1910 and 1920. This discovery arose from his understanding of the mode of transmission of typhus, which led him to realize that the disease could be transmitted from healthy carriers and the animals and humans harboring replicating microbes in their bloodstream or tissues after primary infection could be completely asymptomatic. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he noted, quote, this new concept of inapparent infections that I introduced to pathologists 
is without a doubt the most important of the discoveries that I was able to make. End of the quote. The specific observation that primary infections, whether acute or chronic, could be microbiologically active yet clinically asymptomatic was difficult to reconcile with existing knowledge and the two pillars on which it reposed, the germ and immunological theories of infectious diseases. The immunological theory could not easily account for such heterogeneity um, other than by speculation that related microbes could vaccinate some children against infectious agent. Protective immunity conferred by cross-reactivity can be seen as a radical view of immunological theory. Likewise, a radical view of the germ theory, which we also refer to as the microbiological theory and which is based on the rapid division and evolution of microbes, attributes clinical variability to microbial variability. Yet from the 1920s onward, the position of microbes as the sole explanation for infectious diseases was challenged. And these organisms were demoted to being necessary, but not sufficient for the development of infectious diseases. Especially during primary infection, the principal problem faced by humans throughout their history. Fevers killed mostly children, with far fewer deaths among the elderly. Over the course of the next century, it gradually became clear that most plants, animals and humans infected with most microbes, whether viruses, bacteria, fungi or parasites, continued to thrive. The burden of infectious diseases, the greatest killers of mankind, has been huge, but has turned out to be mostly to the almost infinite number of different microbes rather than to the intrinsic virulence or pathogenicity as each microbe kills only a small proportion of the individuals it infects with only a few exceptions. Human geneticists in the United Kingdom proposed a genetic solution to the problem of asymptomatic infection. Pearson and other population geneticists together with Garot and other clinical geneticists propose that the germline genetic background of the host determines susceptibility or resistance to any given microbe. For once, population and clinical geneticists were in agreement, reinforcing the point from two complementary angles. The clinical evidence was anecdotal, but thought-provoking, whereas the epidemiological evidence was perhaps more subtle, but well thought out, given the design of genetic epidemiological studies at the time. These geneticists did not clearly distinguish between primary and secondary infection, but they did clearly point out the responsibility of the genetic makeup of the host for determining predisposition or susceptibility to infectious diseases. These geneticists also perceived the difficulty of reconciling these views with immunological theories, Earlier, we quoted Garot as emphasizing how difficult it is, quote, to distinguish between immunity which is inborn and that which has been acquired, end of the quote. Concomitantly, Thurbalt Smith, the first great American physician scientist, noted that the existence of survivors in the course of epidemics was due in part to immunological factors overlapping from other diseases in part to genetic individual differences shown on the picture. The respective contributions of host and microbe genetics to the clinical outcome of infectious disease could be seen on the picture. An individual with a strong genetic vulnerability may develop clinical disease following infection with a weak virulent microbe whereas an individual with a low level of genetic vulnerability may develop clinical disease only if infected with a highly virulent microbe. The infection process itself is genetically controlled with resistant and susceptible individuals. Some of the genetic epidemiological data obtained were strong, including, for example, those generated by the classic twin studies in tuberculosis. In addition, other researchers approached the problem from a completely different angle, developing animal models, including inbred mice. In particular, they yielded results 
leading to a similar conclusion as some strains were vulnerable to the infections tested, whereas others were not. Plant biologists and geneticists also noted early in the 20th century that resistance or susceptibility to infection was genetically determined. Altogether, a powerful set of data comprising both experimental infections in plants and animals and natural infections in humans suggested that genetic makeup greatly influences predisposition or resistance to infectious diseases. The stage was set for major progress in the late 1930s, building on multiple independent lines of thought and investigation. However, the advent of antibiotics and sulfonoids in the 1930s and 1940s decreased interest in the question, why worry about the pathogenesis of childhood infections diseases when these conditions could now be treated? In a way, these medicines killed not only microbes, but also the question of clinical inter-individual variability in the course of primary infection in childhood. The immunological theory of diseases could in any case account for some degree of inter-individual heterogeneity. At least in adults and the elderly, childhood infections were left unexplained. Vaccines could prevent and antibiotics could treat childhood infections. Moreover, as discussed in detail below, the advent of antibiotics led to what is perhaps ironically the most helpful ascertainment ass ass bias in the history of human genetics, leading geneticists to focus their attention on red children with multiple recurrent and opportunistic infections. The field of human genetic of, uh, genetics of infectious diseases entered the modern molecular and cellular era in the early 1950s. Progress began simultaneously in two different domains, heading in different directions, led by two different groups, population and clinical geneticists. The population geneticists of infectious diseases paradoxically took off with Anthony Allison's study of plasmodium falciparum malaria, which he considered from the perspective of the impact of infectious diseases on human populations. In 1954, Allison showed that this type of malaria had selected for sickle cell trait carriers, providing what was arguably one of the first pieces of molecular evidence that natural selection operates in humans. Haldane is sometimes presented as being the first to speculate about a possible connection between another erythrocyte disorder and malaria, although others may also have made this suggestion. In any case, human genetic variation in hemoglobin was not seen as the cause of malaria by any of the investigators. Instead, the studies emphasized that infectious diseases were a major force driving in natural selection in humans. The intellectual roots of the field of population genetics of infectious diseases are sometimes erroneously thought to date from this period. In fact, as discussed above, the key ideas in the field are much older. In the early 50s, the field of human genetics of infectious diseases started off in a different direction with the first description of primary immunodeficiencies by clinical geneticists. Primary immunodeficiencies were then defined as rare. Mendelian fully penet penetrant early onset diseases with multiple recurrent and opportunistic infections and avert immunological abnormalities. The clinical phenotype that rarely matters um, and that, with the benefit of hindsight, might have been given precedence, the mere occurrence of a life-threatening infection, regardless of any subsequent infection after antibiotic-driven recovery or any detectable immunological abnormality, was not considered by itself. In hindsight, this narrow focus of studies on primary immunodeficiencies based on recurrent infection detectable only after the use of antibiotics in human populations inevitably led to a narrow definition of immunodeficient individuals and can be viewed as an ascertainment bias. 
Although fruitful, this seminal misconception explains the all too common and ultimately erroneous oxymoron used in medical record notation of lethal or life threatening infection in an immunocompetent individual. Despite this initial limitation, the field of primary immunodeficiencies research had been extraordinarily successful with the development of immunoglobulin G substitution, bone marrow transplantation, and gene therapy. <clears throat> and with some of the first successes in enzyme replacement and cytokine therapy. By contrast, the field of population genetics of infection diseases has fared less well. In any case, there was little or no communication between these two fields for approximately 50 years until the mid-90s when certain observations breached the divide between them. Until the mid-90s, the dominant paradigm in the field of population genetics was that infectious diseases were associated with multiple common variants, as best illustrated by the sickle cell trait conferring resistance to severe malaria. Conversely, the field of clinical genetics was dominated by the idea that rare Mendelian traits confer predisposition to multiple recurrent infections, one gene, multiple infections. The two fields ignored each other until single gene defects in individuals and major gene effects in population were shown to operate. The first three primary immunodeficiencies conferring predisposition to single infectious agent to be described were epidermodysplasia verusiformis, a predisposition to oncogenic human papillomavirus infection, membrane attack complement defects, a predisposition to mycelia, and X-link lymphoproliferative disease, a predisposition to Epstein-Barr virus. From the 1970s onward, the studies paved the way for the discovery in the 1990s and beyond of mutation underlying various other infections, including mycobacterial disease, pneumococcal disease, chronic mucocutaneous disease, and herpes simplex encephalitis. Interestingly, interestingly novel population-based studies also concomitantly diverge from the old polygenic model with the discovery of major genes underlying infectious diseases common in adults such as leishmaniasis, uh, schistomiasis and leprosy, initially in segregation studies and then in genome-like linkage analysis. These major genes were shown to have greater impact on younger than older adults, consistent with the genetic hypothesis that germline influence declines with increasing age whereas somatic variability increasingly accounts for clinical variability with age. The impact of germline variability is probably stronger in children and young adults. In any case, the observation of single gene or lossy underlying infections in otherwise healthy individuals or populations brought the fields of population and clinical genetics of infectious diseases together. Moreover, Mendelian resistance to infectious agents was also detected at the population level, first in the 1970s with the Duffy antigen um, receptor for chemokines and plasmodium vivax malaria, and then again in the mid-90s with CC chemokine receptor 5 and human immunodeficiency virus 1. The coming together of population and clinical genetics of infectious diseases has been fruitful. In particular, it led to the hypothesis that life-threatening childhood infections are due to single gene inborn errors of immunity in the course of primary infections. In this model shown on the picture, symptomatic reactivation and secondary infection in young adults may result from the impact of a major locus, whereas in older adults the course may be more polygenic. Accordingly, the somatic component of disease is thought to play a more important role in disease determinism in adults. This plausible model gives meaning to a newly unified theory of infections. It is also consistent with all the available data, whether from population genetics, 
genetics or clinical genetics and with key immunological and evolutionary concept. On the picture you see a proposed age-dependent genetic architecture of infectious diseases. In this model, single-gene human variants make a major contribution to the determinism of life-threatening infectious diseases of childhood in the course of primary infection. Symptomatic reactivation and secondary infections in young adults may result from the impact of a major locus, whereas in older adults they are less influenced by human germline genetic variations and probably also involve somatic factors. There is also an age-independent impact of human genetic variation on the initial step of resistance of susceptibility to the infectious process itself. Resistance to malaria provided the first and probably the most remarkable example of the role of common human variants in infectious diseases with the discovery in the early 1950s of the protective effect conferred by the sickle cell trait against severe forms of P. falciparum malaria in African population. The sickle cell mutation in the hemoglobin B, hemoglobin B uh, encoding gene has a higher frequency owing to natural selection in regions in which P. falciparum is endemic. Despite the death of most homozygous um, HBSS children with sickle cell disease, the HBS allele has reached high frequencies in African regions, up to 30%, where heterozygosity confers um, enhanced resistance to the life-threatening forms of P. falciparum malaria. Um, the hemoglobin um, as trait may be considered the first major gene identified in a common infectious disease based both on its frequency in some African populations and on its estimated effect on severe malaria. A major gene effect differs from the Mendelian effect in displaying lower penetrance owing to a greater influence of both the environment and other genes in genetically predisposed individuals. However, such effects may still be considerable at the individual level, and a recent large meta-analysis estimated the odds ratio of developing severe malaria for hemoglobin AS heterozygotes and approximately 0.09 with respect to hemoglobin AA homozygotes. <coughs> The hemoglobin S variant also appeared to be the strongest genetic determinant of susceptibility resistance to severe malaria in two recent genome-wide association studies. Another hemo hemoglobin variant, HBC, also enhances resistance to P. falciparum malaria, this effect being strongest in um, hemoglobin CC homozygotes with an estimated odds ratio of um, 0.27 in a large meta-analysis. This recessive resistance may account for the specific spread of the hemoglobin C variant in West Africa and the smaller number of mutation events that have been reported for hemoglobin S. This effect of hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C has provided fascinating insights into population gen genetics and evolutionary biology, offering molecular proof that natural selection operates in humans and that infection is one of the main drivers of this selection. However, the molecular mechanisms underlying the protection conferred by these alleles remain unclear. Various non-mutually exclusive explanations have been proposed, including lower levels of parasite growth in erythrocytes, more efficient parasite-infected erythrocyte removal by phagocytes, impairment of the cytoadhesion to endothelial cells of infected erythrocytes through the abnormal display of P. falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein 1, accelerated development of acquired immunity to the parasite, and translocation of sickle cell erythrocyte microRNAs into P. falciparum inhibiting parasite growth. Finally, although hemoglobin S and hemoglobin 
and other red blood cell variants protecting against severe malaria have been positively selected by malaria in various geographic regions worldwide, most people living in regions of endemic malaria do not carry any of these variants. Nevertheless, only a very small fraction of infected subjects are susceptible to severe malaria, suggesting that the human genes and variants that actually determine the life-threatening infection disease remain to be discovered. From the 1950s onward, candidate gene association studies were carried out by, but were not very successful in infectious diseases. Association studies following genome-wide linkages analysis were more productive as demonstrated by the discovery of major genes underlying several steps in the pathogenesis of leprosy. A recent genome-wide association studies on leprosy also identified some interesting new signals in Chinese population that need to be followed up. However, the most remarkable achievement of genome-wide association studies in infectious diseases and perhaps beyond was their identification in the late 2000s of the IL-28B variants strongly associated with the clearance of um, hepatitis C virus infection. The IL-28B gene encodes the cytokine interleukin 28B, also known as interferon, um, gamma 3, a member of the type 3 interferon family, which also includes interleukin 29 and interleukin 28A. In 2009, a genome wide association study on subjects of European and African American ancestry, along with two subsequent genome wide association studies in Australian, European, and Japanese populations, identified a cluster of IL-28B single nucleotide polymorphism strongly associated with a sustained virological response to interferon A and ribavirin treatment in patients infected with hepatitis uh, C virus infection. The same variants were subsequently found to be associated with spontaneous hepatitis C virus infection clearance. The overall effect of these variants is strong at the population level as the homozygous genotype for the favorable allele increases the likelihood of clearance by a factor of 2 to 3 and is present at high frequency in most populations. The beneficial allele is almost fixed in Eastern Asia but has an intermediate frequency in Europe and is the minor allele in Africa. Many subsequent studies have confirmed this association in various populations and with all hepatitis C viral virus genotypes in different countries, including Egypt, which has the highest rate of HCV infection in the world. The molecular mechanisms underlying this association also remain elusive. Interferon gamma inhibits viral replication in vitro in hepatocyte cell lines. Studies of the relation between IL-28B variants and serum interferon gamma concentration or in IL-28B expression in peripheral mononuclear blood cells or in the liver have provided conflicting and inconclusive results. Studies of intrahepatic interferon-stimulated gene expression has yielded the intriguing results. No relationship has been found between endohepatic interferon-stimulated gene expression and IL-28B genotype in infected individuals, but the favorable IL-28B genotype was found, and found to be associated with low-level interferon-stimulated gene expression into studies focusing on subjects with chronic hepatitis C virus infection. Very interestingly, very interestingly, two recent studies provided a first important clue in deciphering the functional basis of this association by identifying a new dinucleotide variety, very close to IL-28B, 
The place of IL-28B genotyping in personalized treatment regimen is also a matter of debate. In patients who have never been treated, IL-28B status may identify individuals with high probability of achieving an early sustained virological response, in whom the duration of treatment can probably markedly reduce. In previously treated patients, the impact of IL-28B genotype is more limited and may be further decreased by the introduction of efficient new drugs such as protease inhibitors, the response to which may be independent of IL-28B variant. The efficacy and safety of interferon gamma for treating hepatitis C virus infection are also currently being investigated. These discoveries relating to IL-28B validate the general concept of the effect of major genes in immunity, in immunity to infection. However, they also illustrate the difficulties involved in functionality dissecting the role of these variants even when there is a strong effect and the gene has plausible connections with phenotype of interest. Herpes simplex encephalitis is perhaps the most striking example of an isolated and severe childhood infection eventually shown to result from single gene inborn errors of immunity. In this terrible disease, the most common periodic viral encephalitis in Western countries, the virus is restricted to the central nervous system. It is absent from the bloodstream and does not spread to other organs. Herpes simplex virus 1 is neutrotropic in terms of both the route it follows and its destination. It reaches the central nervous system via cranial nerves, Patients with the most severe myeloid and lymphoid primary immunodeficiencies, including children with no T-cells, display no particular susceptibility to herpes simplex encephalitis. The disease is sporadic in the vast majority of cases, with only four multiplex kindreds reported in 60 years. Uh, there is, however, a high frequency of parental consanguinity suggesting that herpes simplex encephalitis may be due to single gene inborn errors of immunity displaying incomplete clinical penetrance. The first genetic etiology of herpes simplex encephalitis was identified as autosomal recessive UNC 93B deficiency resulting in an impairment of cellular response to the four infracellular toll-like receptors TLRs including a toll like receptor free. Involvement of TLR free pathway was then suspected because uh, certain uh, patients whose cells did not respond to TLR79 agonists were not prone to herpes simplex encephalitis. TLR free was formally implicated in the disease when autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive TLR free deficiencies were discovered in other patients with herpes simplex encephalitis. The subsequent identification of children with autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant uh, TRIF deficiency confirmed the role of TLR free TRIF circuit and further suggested that childhood herpes simplex encephalitis might result from a collection of highly diverse but immunologically related single gene lesions. Herpes simplex encephalitis causing heterozygous mutations of TRA3 further highlighted the potential role of subtle mutations of pleiotropic genes in narrow clinical phenotypes. In autosomal dominant uh, TRA of free deficiency and the mutation is dominant negative and impaired TLR free responses account for herpes simplex encephalitis, whereas the other cellular phenotypes such as impaired responses to members of the tumor necrosis factor <coughs> receptors superfamily are clinically silent. There is a broad immunological phenotype but a narrow infectious phenotype, probably because the threshold for clinical consequences differ between cellular phenotypes. By contrast, in autosomal dominant CBK1 deficiency, a more recently defined etiology of herpes simplex encephalitis, 
There is a narrow cellular phenotype apparently restricted to the Taylor free pathway, although CBK1, like TRAF3, is involved in multiple signaling pathways. This is consistent with the narrow infectious phenotype. Patients with NEMA mutations are broadly susceptible to viral infections, including herpes simplex encephalitis, reflecting the impairment of antiviral interferon production in response to the stimulation of multiple receptors, including TLR3 in their cells. The target genes downstream from TLR3 involved in herpes simplex encephalitis were identified as antiviral interferon encoding genes in 2003, when patients with complete STAT1 deficiency were found to be prone to multiple viral diseases, including herpes simplex encephalitis. The physiological resolution paradoxically made it more difficult to establish the germ theory of diseases. Once established, the germ theory in turn made it difficult to digest the demonstration of latent and inapparent asymptomatic infections. The fundamental problem in the field of infectious diseases was posed in the years 1905-1915 with the gradual discovery that most people, including most children, were infected asymptomatically with most microbes even during the course of primary infection. So how can we account for inter-individual variability in the course of infection? The immunological theory best accounts for inter-individual variability in the course of reactivation and secondary infection. This is somatic theory with acquired adaptive immunity contributing to the outcome of infection. It was not originally conceived to account for inter-individual variability in the course of primary infection. Phagocytosis and inmate immunity could not account for the specificity of immune responses and were not thought to be genetically determined. The concept of inborn errors of immunity originated from both population genetics and clinical genetics. Population geneticists um, and clinical geneticists have often disagreed over the past century, but they agreed early on that infection diseases have a strong germline genetic determinism in individuals and populations. In number of elegant genetic studies in plant and animal models by forward genetics in particular have established um, that host genetic makeup is an essential determinant of susceptibility of resistance to infection. In the mouse model, spectacular achievement uh, have resulted from strain comparison and linkage studies leading, for example, for the discovery of uh, the BCG, CMV and LPS loci. The study of quantitative trait loci in the development of n ethyl n neutrozaria programs have extended the fruitful line of research to the host component of infection diseases. At the population level, the field of human genetics of infectious diseases began with the discovery that the sickle cell trait provides significant protection against severe forms of plasmodium falciparum malaria. Many other candidate gene association studies failed to, research, to reach such a level of significance and robustness. Genome-wide linkage studies have been more successful with the identification of major loci for schistosomiasis and leprosy. Genome-wide association studies have been less successful so far with the notable exception of the important discovery of the role of interferon gamma in the clearance of HCV infection spontaneously on response to interferon alpha treatment. There are examples of Mendelian resistance to virulent agents at the population level. Individuals lacking dark expression on erythrocytes are resistant to plasmodium vivax. Those lacking functional CCR5 are resistant to R5 tropic strains of HIV. Those lacking FUT2 are resistant to non noroviruses. All three deficiencies are autosomal recessive. According to their first descriptions in the 1950s, classical primary immunodeficiencies are fully penetrant Mendelian traits 
that confer early onset vulnerability to multiple recurrent opportunistic infections owing to detectable immunological phenotype. X-link agama globulinemia is a typical example of such a disease. From the 1970s onward, new primary immunodeficiencies were shown to confer predisposition to a single infectious agent. This is illustrated by X-link lymphoproliferative disease and susceptibility to Epstein-Barr virus. Other examples include epidermodysplasia, verusiformis, and defects of the terminal components of complement. The most thoroughly investigated syndrome in is Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases leading to the dissection of the first genetic etiologies of childhood tuberculosis. The genetic dissection of childhood herpes simplex encephalitis provided the first example of the sporadic common primary infectious disease owing to a single gen inborn errors of immunity with incomplete clinical penetrance. Deciphering single gene lesions underlying life threatening infection diseases of children, currently only a very small proportion of individual infections and infected individuals are understood in genetic terms. This process is facilitated by next generation sequencing, but there are many infections and countless sick children, and the level of genetic heterogeneity may be very high. Uh, another important future issue is investigating the frequency of morbid alleles and their actual clinical penetrance. The respective roles of very rare, rare and more common alleles in the determinism of very rare, rare and more common infections should be defined. A related goal is understanding the mechanisms underlying incomplete clinical penetrance. In other areas, exploring the interactions between the human genome and microbial genomes. The fields of cellular microbiology and microbial pathogenesis should be combined with that of human genetics to improve dissection of the actual pathogenesis of infectious diseases. Some inborn errors of immunity may be specific not only to certain microbes, but also to microbes expressing specific factors or to microbes infecting specific tissues and organs. And another area is deciphering the Mendelian basis of resistance to past and present life threatening infectious diseases caused by highly virulent microbes upon primary infection at all ages. Current examples include Ebola virus disease, coronavirus respiratory disease, avian flu and swine flu. Past examples include plaque and poliomyelitis. Another area is dissecting the inherited component of adult infectious diseases. The component will be difficult to disentangle from the contribution of somatic immunity with its genetic and epigenetic components. This is particularly important for diseases such as tuberculosis, which are transmitted by sick adults following reactivation from latency. In other areas, genetically investigating the relationship between the tissue specificity of numerous childhood infections and the contribution of intrinsic immunity, the role of non-hematopoietic cells has historically been neglected in immunology. Herpes simplex encephalitis is an example of disease caused by single-gen inborn errors of intrinsic immunity in the central nervous system. There are almost certainly other examples. Another issue is revisiting immunology based on studies of the genetic determinism of clinical disease in the course of primary infection in children and young adults in particular. This dissection of experiments of nature provides the unique added value that the function of host defense genes is defined in natura, meaning in the setting of a natural ecosystem governed by natural selection. Translating human genetic findings into therapeutic advances is another area that should be also addressed. This would allow the molecular diagnosis of patients, genetic counseling of their families, and improvements in this prediction of prognosis. It would also make it possible to develop novel treatments with recombinant molecules aiming to remedy the genetic deficiency of the immune system and might lead to new types of vaccines or to the vaccination of a targeted individual. Thank you for your attention. We'll continue during the next lecture.